Gaspar Ruiz by Joseph Conrad Read by Donald Miller A revolutionary war raises many strange characters out of the obscurity which is the common lot of humble lives in an undisturbed state of society. Certain individualities grow into fame through their vices and their virtues or simply by their actions, which may have a temporary importance, and then they become forgotten. The names of a few leaders alone survive the end of armed strife and are further preserved in history, so that, vanishing from men's active memories, they still exist in books. The name of General Santierra attained that cold paper and ink immortality. He was a South American of good family, and the books published in his lifetime numbered him amongst the liberators of that continent from the oppressive rule of Spain. That long contest, waged for independence on one side and for dominion on the other, developed in the course of years and the vicissitudes of changing fortune, the fierceness uh, and inhumanity of a struggle for life. All feelings of pity and compassion disappeared in the growth of political hatred. And as is usual in war, the mass of the people, who had the least to gain by the issue, suffered most in their obscure persons and their humble fortunes. General Santierra began his service as lieutenant in the Patriot Army raised and commanded by the famous San Martin, afterwards conqueror of Lima and liberator of Peru. A great battle had just been fought on the banks of the river Bio Bio. Amongst the prisoners made upon the routed royalist troops, there was a soldier called Gaspar Ruiz. His powerful build and his big head rendered him remarkable amongst his fellow captives. The personality of the man was unmistakable. Some months before, he had been missed from the ranks of Republican troops after one of the many skirmishes which preceded the great battle. And now, having been captured in arms in hand amongst royalists, he could expect no other fate but to be shot as a deserter. Gaspar Ruiz, however, was not a deserter. His mind was hardly active enough to take a discriminating view of the advantages or perils of treachery. Why should he change sides? He had really been made a prisoner, had suffered ill usage and many privations. Neither side showed tenderness to its adversaries. There came a day when he was ordered, together with some other captured rebels, to march in the front rank of the royal troops. A musket had been thrust into his hands. He had taken it. He had marched. He did not want to be killed with circumstances of peculiar atrocity for refusing to march. He did not understand heroism, but it was his intention to throw his musket away after the first opportunity. Meantime, he had gone on loading and firing from fear of having his brains blown out. At the first sign of unwillingness by some non-commissioned officer of the King of Spain, he tried to set forth these elementary considerations before the sergeant of the guard set over him and some twenty other such deserters who had been condemned summarily to be shot. It was in the quadrangle of the fort at the back of the batteries which command the roadstead of Valparaiso. The officer who had identified him had gone on without listening to his protestations. His doom was sealed. His hands were tied very tightly together behind his back. His body was sore all over from the many blows with sticks and butts of muskets which had hurried him along on the painful road from the place of his capture to the gate of the fort. This was the kind of systematic attention the prisoners had received from their escort during a four days journey across a scantily watered tract of country. At the crossings of rare streams, they were permitted to quench their thirst by lapping hurriedly like dogs. In the evening, a few scraps of meat were thrown amongst them as they dropped down dead beat upon the stony ground of the halting place. 
As he stood in the courtyard of the castle in the early morning, after having been driven hard all night, Gaspar Ruiz's throat was parched, and his tongue felt very large and dry in his mouth. And Gaspar Ruiz, besides being very thirsty, was stirred by a feeling of sluggish anger, which he could not very well express, as though the vigor of his spirit were by no means equal to the strength of his body. The other prisoners in the batch of the condemned hung their heads, looking obstinately on the ground. But Gaspar Ruiz kept on repeating, What should I desert for to the royalists? Why should I desert? Tell me, Esteban. He addressed himself to the sergeant, who happened to belong to the same part of the country as himself. But the sergeant, after shrugging, his meager shoulders once paid no further attention to the deep murmuring voice at his back. It was indeed strange that Gaspar Ruiz should desert. His people were in too humble a station to feel much the disadvantages of any form of government. There was no reason why Gaspar Ruiz should wish to uphold in his own person the rule of the King of Spain. Neither had he been anxious to exert himself for its subversion. He had joined the side of independence in an extremely reasonable and natural manner. A band of patriots appeared one morning, early, surrounding his father's ranch. Spearing the watchdogs and hamstringing a fat cow, all in the twinkling of an eye to the cries of Viva la Libertad, their officer discoursed of liberty with enthusiasm and eloquence after a long and refreshing sleep. When they left in the evening, taking with them some of Ruiz, the father's, best horses, to replace their own lamed animals, Gaspar Ruiz went away with them, having been invited pressingly to do so by the eloquent officer. Shortly afterwards, a detachment of royalist troops, coming to pacify the district, burnt the ranch, carried off the remaining horses and cattle, and having thus deprived the old people of all their worldly possessions, left them sitting under a bush in the enjoyment of the inestimable boon of life. Gaspar Ruiz, condemned to death as a deserter, was not thinking either of his native place or of his parents, on account of the mildness of his character and the great strength of his limbs. The practical advantage of this last was made still more valuable to his father by his obedient disposition. Gaspar Ruiz had an acquiescent soul, but it was stirred now to a sort of dim revolt by his dislike to die the death of a traitor. He was not a traitor. He said again to the sergeant, You know I did not desert Esteban. You know I remained behind amongst the trees with three others to keep the enemy back while the detachment was running away. Lieutenant Santiara, little more than a boy at the time, and unused as yet to the sanguinary imbecilities of a state of war, had lingered nearby, as if fascinated by the sight of these men who were to be shot presently for an example, as the commandant had said. The sergeant, without deigning to look at the prisoner, addressed himself to the young officer with a superior smile. Ten men would not have been enough to make him a prisoner, me teniente. Moreover, the other three rejoined the detachment after dark. Why should he, wounded and the strongest of them all, have failed to do so? My strength is as nothing against a mounted man with a lasso, Gaspar Ruiz protested eagerly. He dragged me behind his horse for half a mile. At this excellent reason, the sergeant only laughed contemptuously. The young officer hurried away after the commandante. Presently, the adjutant of the castle came by. He was a truculent, raw-boned man in a ragged uniform. His spluttering voice issued out of a flat yellow face. The sergeant learned from him that the condemned man would not be shot till sunset. He begged then to know what he was to do with, with them in the meantime. The adjutant looked savagely round the courtyard and pointing to the door of a small dungeon-like guardroom, receiving 
light and air through one heavily barred window said, Drive the scoundrels in there. The sergeant, tightening his grip upon the stick he carried in virtue of his rank, executed this order with alacrity and zeal. He hit Gaspar Ruiz, whose movements were slow over his head and shoulders. Gaspar Ruiz stood still for a moment under the shower of blows, biting his lips thoughtfully, as if absorbed by a perplexing mental process, then followed the others without haste. The door was locked, and the adjutant carried off the key. By noon the heat of that low-vaulted place, crammed to suffocation, had become unbearable. The prisoners crowded towards the window, begging their guards for a drop of water, but the soldiers remained lying in indolent attitudes, wherever there was a little shade under a wall, while the sentry sat with his back against the door smoking a cigarette, and raising his eyebrows philosophically from time to time. Gaspar Ruiz had pushed his way to the window with irresistible force. His capacious chest needed more air than the others. His big face, resting with its chin on the ledge, pressed close to the bars, seemed to support the other faces crowded up for breath. From moaned entreaties they had passed to desperate cries, and the tumultuous howling of those thirsty men obliged a young officer who was just then crossing the courtyard to shout in order to make himself heard, why don't you give some water to these prisoners? The sergeant, with an air of surprised innocence, excused himself by the remark that all those men were condemned to die in a few hours. Lieutenant Santier stamped his foot. They are condemned to die, not to torture, he shouted. Give them some water at once. Impressed by this appearance of anger, the soldiers bestirred themselves, and the sentry, snatching up his musket, stood to attention. But when a couple of buckets were found and filled from the well, it was discovered that they could not be passed through the bars, which were set too close. At the prospect of quenching their thirst, the shrieks of those trampled down and the struggle to get near the opening became very heart-rending. But when the soldiers who had lifted the buckets towards the window put them to the ground again helplessly, the yell of disappointment was still more terrible. The soldiers of the Army of Independence were not equipped with canteens. A small tin cup was found, but its approach to the opening caused such a commotion, such yells of rage and pain in the vague mass of limbs behind the straining faces at the window, that Lieutenant Santierre cried out hurriedly, No, no, you must open the door, Sergeant. The sergeant, shrugging his shoulders, explained that he had no right to open the door, even if he had had the key, but he had not the key. The adjutant of the garrison kept the key. Those men were giving much unnecessary trouble, since they had to die at sunset in any case. Why they had not been shot at once early in the morning he could not understand. Lieutenant Santierre kept his back studiously to the window. It was at his earnest solicitations that the commandante had delayed the execution. This favor had been granted to him in consideration of his distinguished family and of his father's high position amongst the chiefs of the Republican Party. Lieutenant Santiara believed that the general commanding would visit the fort sometime in the afternoon, and he ingeniously hoped that his naive intercession would induce that severe man to pardon some, at least, of those criminals. In the revulsion of his feeling, his interference stood revealed now as guilty and futile meddling. It appeared to him obvious that the general would never even consent to listen to his petition. He could never save those men, and he had only made himself responsible for the sufferings added to the cruelty of their fate. They go at once and get the key from the adjutant, said Lieutenant Santierra. The sergeant shook his head with a sort of bashful smile, while his eyes glanced sideways at Gaspar Ruiz's face, motionless and silent, staring through the bars at the bottom of a heap, 
of other haggard, distorted, yelling faces. His worship, the adjutant de plaza, the sergeant murmured, was having his siesta, and supposing that he, the sergeant, would be allowed access to him, the only result he expected would be to have his soul flogged out of his body for presuming to disturb his worship's repose. He made a deprecatory movement with his hands and stood stock still, looking down modestly upon his brown toes. Lieutenant Santiara glared with indignation, but hesitated. His handsome oval face, as smooth as a girl's, flushed with the shame of his perplexity. Its nature humiliated his spirit. His hairless upper lip trembled. He seemed on the point of either bursting into a fit of rage or into tears of dismay. Fifty years later, General Santierra, the venerable relic of revolutionary times, was well able to remember the feelings of the young lieutenant. Since he had given up riding altogether and found it difficult to walk beyond the limits of his garden, the general's greatest delight was to entertain in his house the officers of the foreign men of war visiting the harbor. For Englishmen, he had a preference, as for old companions in arms. English naval men of all ranks accepted his hospitality with curiosity, because he had known Lord Cochrane and had taken part on board the Patriot Squadron commanded by the marvelous seamen in the cutting out and blockading operations before Calio, an episode of unalloyed glory in the wars of independence and of endless honor in the fighting tradition of Englishmen. He was a fair linguist, this ancient survivor of the liberating armies, a trick of smoothing his long white beard whenever he was short of a word in French or English imparted an air of leisurely dignity to the tone of his reminiscences. Yes, my friends, he used to say to his guests, what would you have? A youth of seventeen summers without worldly experience and owing my rank only to the glorious patriotism of my father, may God rest his soul, I suffered immense humiliation, not so much from the disobedience of that subordinate, who, after all, was responsible for those prisoners, but I suffered because, like the boy I was, I myself dreaded going to the adjutant for the key. I had felt, before, his rough and cutting tongue. Being quite a common fellow with no merit except his savage valor, he made me feel his contempt and dislike from the first day I joined my battalion in garrison at the fort. It was only a fortnight before. I would have confronted him sword in hand, but I shrank from the mocking brutality of his sneers. I don't remember having been so miserable in my life before or since. The torment of my sensibility was so great that I wished the sergeant to fall dead at my feet, and the stupid soldiers who stared at me to turn into corpses, and even those wretches for whom my entreaties had procured a reprieve, I wished dead also, because I could not face them without shame. A mephitic heat, like a whiff of air from hell, came out of that dark place in which they were confined, those at the window who heard what was going on jeered at me in very desperation. One of these fellows, gone mad, no doubt, kept on urging me volubly to order the soldiers to fire through the window. His insane loquacity made my heart turn faint, and my feet were like lead. There was no higher office to whom I could appeal. I had not even the firmness of spirit to simply go away. Benumbed by my remorse, I stood with my back to the window. You must not suppose that all this lasted a long time. How could it have been? A minute? If measured by mental suffering, it was like a hundred years. A longer time than all my life has been since. No, certainly, it was not so much as a minute. The hoarse screaming of those miserable wretches died out in their dry throats and then suddenly a voice spoke a deep voice muttering calmly it called upon me to turn round 
That voice, senores, proceeded from the head of Gaspar Ruiz. Of his body I could see nothing. Some of his fellow captives had clambered upon his back. He was holding them up. His eyes blinked without looking at me. That and the moving of his lips was all he seemed able to manage in his overloaded state. And when I turned round, this head, that seemed more than human size resting on its chin under a multitude of other heads, asked me whether I really desired to quench the thirst of the captives. I said yes, yes, eagerly, and came up quite close to the window. I was like a child, and did not know what would happen. I was anxious to be comforted in my helplessness and remorse. Have you the authority, Senor Tientiente, to release my wrists from their bonds? Gaspar Ruiz's head asked me. His features expressed no anxiety, no hope. His heavy eyelids blinked upon his eyes that looked past me straight into the courtyard. As if in an ugly dream I spoke, stammering, What do you mean? And how can I reach the bonds of your wrists? I will try what I can do, he said, and then that large staring head moved at last, and all the wild faces piled up in that window disappeared, tumbling down. He had shaken his load off with one movement, so strong he was. And he had not only shaken it off, but he got free of the crush and vanished from my sight. For a moment there was no one at all to be seen at the window. He had swung about butting and shouldering, clearing a space for himself in the only way he could do it, with his hands tied behind his back. Finally, backing to the opening, he pushed out to me between the bars his wrists, lashed with many turns of rope. His hands, very swollen, were knotted veins, looked enormous and unwieldy. I saw his bent back. It was very broad. His voice was like the muttering of a bull. Cut, Senor Teniente, cut. I drew my sword, my new unblunted sword that had seen no services yet, and severed the many turns of the hide rope. I did this without knowing the why and the wherefore of my action, but as it were compelled by faith in that man. The sergeant made it as if to cry out, but astonishment deprived him of his voice, and he remained standing with his mouth open as if overtaken by sudden imbecility. I sheathed my sword and faced the soldiers. An air of awestruck exasperation had replaced their usual listless apathy. I heard the voice of Gaspar Ruiz shouting inside, but the words I could not make out plainly. I suppose that to see him with his arms free augmented the influence of his strength. I mean by this the spiritual influence that with ignorant people attaches to an exceptional degree of bodily vigor. In fact, he was no more to be feared than before on account of the numbness of his arms and hands, which lasted for some time. The sergeant had recovered his power of speech. By all the saints, he cried, we shall have to get a cavalry man with a lasso to secure him again, if he is to be led to the place of execution. Nothing less than a good endlazador on a good horse can subdue him. Your worship was pleased to perform a very mad thing. I had nothing to say. I was surprised myself, and I felt a childish curiosity to see what would happen. But the sergeant was thinking of the difficulty of controlling Gaspar Ruiz when the time for making an example would come. Or perhaps, the sergeant pursued vexedly, we shall be obliged to shoot him down as he dashes out when the door is opened. He was going to give further vent to his anxieties as to the proper carrying out of the sentence, but he interrupted himself with a sudden exclamation and snatched a musket from a soldier and stood watchful with his eyes fixed on the window. Gaspar Ruiz had climbed up on the sill and sat down there with his feet against the thickness of the wall and his knees slightly bent. 
The window was not quite broad enough for the length of his legs. It appeared to my crestfallen perception that he meant to keep the window all to himself. He seemed to be taking up a comfortable position. Nobody inside dared to approach him. Now he could strike with his hands. Poor Dios, I heard the sergeant muttering at my elbow. I shall shoot him through the head now and get rid of that trouble. He is a condemned man. At that I looked at him angrily. The general has not confirmed the sentence, I said, though I knew well in my heart that these were but vain words. The sentence required no confirmation. You have no right to shoot him unless he tries to escape, I added firmly. But sangre de Dios, the sergeant yelled out, bringing his musket up to his shoulder. He's escaping now, look. But I, as if that Gaspar had cast a spell upon me, struck the musket upward, and the bullet flew over the roofs somewhere. The sergeant dashed his arm to the ground and stared. He might have commanded the soldiers to fire, but he did not. And if he had, he would not have been obeyed, I think, just then. With his feet against the thickness of the wall and his hairy hands grasping the iron bar, Gaspar sat still. It was an attitude. Nothing happened for a time, and suddenly it dawned upon us that he was straightening his bowed back and contracting his arms. His lips were twisted into a snarl. Next thing we perceived was that the bar of forged iron was being bent slowly by the mightiness of his pull. The sun was beating full upon his cramped, unquivering figure. A shower of sweat drops burst out of his forehead. Watching the bar grow crooked, I saw a little blood ooze from under his fingernails. Then he let go. For a moment, he remained all huddled up with a hanging head, looking drowsily into the upturned palms of his mighty hands. Indeed, he seemed to have dozed off. Suddenly, he flung himself backwards on the sill and setting the soles of his feet against the other middle bar, he bent that one too, but in the opposite direction from the first. Such was his strength, which, in this case, relieved my painful feelings and the man seemed to have done nothing except for the change of position in order to use his feet which made us all start by its swiftness my recollection of that immobility but he had bent the bars wide apart and now he could get out if he liked but he dropped his legs inwards and looking over his shoulder beckoned to the soldiers hand up the water he said i will give them all a drink he was obeyed for a moment I expected man and bucket to disappear, overwhelmed by the rush of eagerness. I thought they would pull him down with their teeth. There was a rush, but holding the bucket on his lap, he repulsed the assault of those wretches by the mere swinging of his feet. They flew backward at every kick, yelling with pain, and the soldiers laughed, gazing at the window. They all laughed, holding their sides, except the sergeant who was gloomy and morose. He was afraid the prisoners would rise and break out, which would have been a bad example. But there was no fear of that, and I stood myself before the window with my drawn sword. When sufficiently tamed by the strength of Gaspar Ruiz, they came up one by one, stretching their necks and presenting their lips to the edge of the bucket, which the strong man tilted towards them from his knees with an extraordinary air of charity, gentleness, and compassion. That benevolent appearance was, of course, the effect of his care in not spilling the water and of his attitude as he sat on the sill. For if a man lingered with his lips glued to the rim of the bucket after Gaspar Ruiz had said, You have had enough, there would be no tenderness or mercy, and the shove of the foot which would send him groaning and doubled up far into the interior of the prison, where he would knock down two or three others before he fell himself. They came up to him again and again. It looked as if they meant to drink the well dry before going to their death, but the soldiers were so amused by Gaspar Ruiz's systematic proceedings that they carried the water up to the window cheerfully.' 
When the adjutant came out after his siesta, there was some trouble over this affair, I can assure you, and the worst of it, that the general whom we expected never came to the castle that day. The guests of General Santierra unanimously expressed their regret that the man of such strength and patience had not been saved. He was not saved by my interference, said the general. The prisoners were led to execution half an hour before sunset. Gaspar Ruiz, contrary to the sergeant's apprehensions, gave no trouble. There was no necessity to get a cavalry man with a lasso in order to subdue him, as if he were a wild bull of the campo. I believe he marched out with his arms free amongst the others who were bound. I did not see. I was not there. I had been put under arrest for interfering with the prisoner's guard. About dusk, sitting dismally in my quarters, I heard three volleys fired and thought that I should never hear of Gaspar Ruiz again. He fell with the others, but we were to hear of him nevertheless, though the sergeant boasted that, as he lay on his face expiring or dead in the heap of the slain, he had slashed his neck with a sword. He had done this, he said, to make sure of ridding the world of a dangerous traitor. I confess to you, senors, that I thought of that strong man with a sort of gratitude and with some admiration. He had used his strength honorably. There dwelt, then, in his soul no fierceness corresponding to the vigor of his body.